think we've got a great program assembled this year, as you can see on the screen, and we have a couple of really exciting, to talk, exciting topics to hear about this afternoon. Um, incidentally, all of our speakers are joining us from Australia, and it's really early in the morning there, so I want to express my appreciation for them losing a little bit of sleep in order to join us today. I also want to thank Angus Australia for sponsoring this session today. They're a gold level sponsor and one of our international partners for the meeting this year. And as you've heard throughout the program the last couple of days, the sponsors are really critical pieces to this program and bringing you such a high quality program and being able to offer the meeting to attendees for free. So a big thank you to all of our sponsors and especially to Angus Australia specifically for being a gold level sponsor for this session. With that, um, thank you all again for attending, and I will introduce our first speaker. Okay, so our first speaker today is Dr. Matt Wilcott. Matt works with the Animal Genetic and Breeding Unit, often referred to as AGBU, since October of 2004. His goals are to, de to develop and improve genetic evaluation technologies for beef cattle breeders, which is directly relevant to what he'll be sharing with us today. His key areas of research have included development of novel traits for female productivity in tropically adapted cattle, and development of male fertility traits both as direct descriptors of bull fertility and as genetic indicators for female reproduction. He's worked with development and implementation of a large reference population of Brahmin seed stock that can contribute high quality male and female reproduction phenotypes to the breed plan evaluation. He's also done work in temperate breeds, most notably a collaborative project to improve understanding of cow productivity. Um, with that, uh, let's welcome Matt to hear about the application of novel reproductive traits to genetic evaluation in both tropical and temperate beef breeds. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining in on this unusual version of, of a conference uh, and thanks also to the organisers of BIF for asking me to come and talk about some work we've been doing in Australia you know, over the last 20 years or so. I was asked to talk about new reproduction traits that we're including in our genetic evaluation, um, how we're working those into industry, and how people are taking advantage of those to accelerate genetic progress for these economically very important traits. So there are three main areas I'd like to cover over the course of this presentation. The first is looking at how these new reproduction traits were developed uh, and that's going back some time into the research undertaken as part of the, the beef CRC. Secondly, I'd like to look at how these traits have been implemented in industry, and that'll be a fairly brief summary of the Reproomics project, uh, and then a closer look at work we're doing within a specific Brahmin seed stock herd, uh, bringing these you know, hard to measure and quite expensive traits into industry. Finally, I'd like to talk about some more recent research uh, in temperate breeds, Angus and Hereford specifically, uh, that's examining the genetics of reproduction for those more southern adapted sorts of animals. So firstly, just a bit of a look at how these reproduction traits were developed. Um, and I really see this as having the aim of creating opportunities for breeders to select to improve reproductive rates in, in tropical beef cattle. So as I kind of pointed, on, pointed out earlier, the Beef CRC was a, a multidisciplinary collaborative research project. Uh, it involved lots of scientists looking at lots of aspects of productivity in the beef industry. Um, a key component of it was that it's industry supported um, and all of the CRCs required that they have industry funding which was matched by the government um, to allow the research to happen uh, and in this case we had you know, significant support from from industry to focus on tropical genotypes and you know it very quickly became clear that reproduction was a key aspect of what what we needed to look at. 
Um, as I said, it was about a 14 year progeny test. As part of the first round of that enterprise, um, we looked at steer productivity, which included, you know, carcass traits. Um, and we were also looking at heifer reproduction traits in their half sib sisters. In the second phase, we moved on to look at cow rebreeding and lifetime reproductive performance. So just a quick look at the design of the experiment. It didn't involve massive numbers of animals. Uh, we really had the philosophy that we wanted to record everything we possibly could on these animals. Um, and that being the case, we were not able to do it on a, a massive scale. But over that period, we looked at the performance of around a thousand Brahmin females and about 1100 tropical composites. Those were all bred in cooperator stud herds and then contributed to the CRC where they moved to research properties at weaning. Um, the breeding was designed. Um, there were about 50 Brahmin size and 50 tropical composite size, and they were allocated to ensure genetic linkage across the herds of origin and the properties where those females ended up. So female reproduction was in court, recorded intensively in these animals. And as we said, their half sib brothers were finished in the feedlot uh, to about a 540 kilo live weight specification. So just a bit on the management of the females involved in these projects. So as we just saw, they were located at four research stations around Northern Australia. Heifers were first mated as two-year-olds, which is very much standard for the industry up there. Um, a little less standard, we enforced a fairly tight three-month mating period. Um, there is plenty of enterprises that leave bulls out all year round up there, but in this instance, we wanted to you know, push them reproductively and a short, shorter joining period allowed us to do that. They were managed under decidedly commercial conditions. Um, feeding only happened, you know, to avoid any critical body condition situations arising, which certainly did happen over the years that CIC ran. Um, but there was never intent that these animals be maintained in anything but commercial conditions. We also made sure we gave females the opportunity to express as much of their genetic differences for reproductive performance as we could, which meant that we retained all of the females in the experiment unless they failed to wean a calf in consecutive years. So I think this is a key part of this aspect of the presentation and is central to what we will look at going forward. Uh, this is just looking at the traits that we've develop to allow us to describe female reproduction. Um, for female traits, they, they exploit ultrasound scanning to look at ovarian function. It's a process that's very similar to, to preg testing, uh, but the technician has a, an ultrasound probe and are able to image the, the ovaries fairly carefully and identify whether an animal is cycling or this is just a comparison of, on the left, a prepubital ovary uh, showing a lot of small black follicles, but no, no apparent corpus luteum, where on the right we see an ovary that is completely dominated by a single large CL. Um, once you get a bit of practice with it, uh, they are structures that can be identified fairly easily, um, but doing so quickly and accurately takes a lot of practice and a lot of skill. And it's something we've been thinking about as we go forward with this building, a bit of capacity in the industry for people to provide this service. So the first trait that we defined uh, was age at puberty, and it was based on serial ultrasound scans to observe estrus, um, which meant that scanning started in animals at a, around 200 kilos, uh, which wasn't long after weaning for many of these cohorts. 
and carried through for each heifer until a corpus luteum was identified. Um, and that meant for some animals having up to 15 scans, you know, before they identified that the animals were cyclic. The next key trait was one that was measured <clears throat> in lactating females. Um, and again, use this ultrasound scanning to identify when a lactating female recommence cycling um, after the birth of a first calf. It was calculated as days from bull in, uh, the start of natural mating, until that first seal was detected. And by the end of the CRC period, we had you know, about 60 records on animals that stayed in the, in the experiment for their entire lives, which meant we had you know, more than 350,000 scans collected over that 12 year period or so. And this is the first of the results I'd like to share from this beef CRC research. Uh, and these relate to cow lifetime weaning rate, which is just the number of calves a cow weaned divided by the number of mating seasons that she was in the experiment. I think the key numbers to look at here are the average for Brahmins at 0.62 or 62% and for tropical composites at just under 80%. Um, yeah, and these low reproductive rates are really what motivated a lot of the work done in this project. We've also got the range in sire EBVs for the, the size of these females. And in Brahmins that went from minus 11% to plus 16%, which means there was a difference of 27% in the weaning rate uh, between the best and the worst sires. Like a lot of reproduction traits, it's not especially heritable, uh, around 0.1 for both genotypes. And that low heritability combined with the, you know, the extreme economic importance of these traits uh, is a lot of the reason that we were pursuing the traits we'll, we'll go on to have a look at in just a minute. In contrast, our aged puberty trait was extremely heritable in, in the animals evaluated for this study. Um, in Brahmins, it was 0.6%, uh, sorry, 60% heritable. In tropical composites, 50% heritable. Um, there was also large genetic variation for the trait within those genotypes. And this plot's just a, a demonstration of that for the Brahmin females. So the horizontal axis there is age in days at which females displayed their first corpus luteum were, were pubertal. And the y-axis uh, is just the number of females that were pubertal at, at that, those ages. So this is a distribution of age at puberty um, in the Brahmin females. We can see with mating at around two years of age, there's only about half of those females cycling as they go into their first mating season. Given that we only applied a three month mating period, um, beyond the end of those three months, there's still 13% of animals which failed to reach puberty. And that's going to have, you know, a dramatic impact on the potential for uh, high weaning rates to be recorded. Of those which did cycle, uh, about 90% conceived and 72% weaned a calf, which gave us our overall weaning rate of about 60%. I think the, the key result here is with this high heritability and large genetic variation, there is huge opportunity to apply selection to improve aged puberty in Brahmin females. And that was certainly the case for tropical composites as well. For the lactation and estrus interval trait, um, we also saw high heritabilities. Uh, the composites had a heritability of 30%, the Brahmins 50%. Again, large variation within these genotypes. Um, which means we've got lots of opportunity to identify genetically superior animals. And I think when discussing these two traits, it's worth pointing out that aged puberty only directly influences 
the first mating outcome of, of females where like this lactation and estrus trade bites every time uh, animals go through the breeding cycle. Uh, so as far as economic impact, lactation and estrus interval is probably the more important of the trades. So this is just an example of estimated breeding values for the Brahmin sires that were involved in this study. Uh, and it's worth for this audience pointing out that the EBVs we publish in Australia are descriptors of the animals in themselves and not the, the differences we expect to see in their progeny, which just means that EBVs are twice the value of an EPD. And what we saw was that for these Brahmin sires, there was a range, um, even if we cut off the outlier at the bottom of the page, of better than 200 days uh, between the top and bottom sires. Um, this means that the best size progeny will have an, a lactation and estrus period three months shorter than those of the worst sires in this list. Uh, and it's, it's worth pointing out as we look down this list of beef CRC sires uh, and their lactation and estrus EBVs that the more negative the breeding value, the more favourable uh, the reproductive outcomes. Um, so we're wanting lower rather than higher EBVs. It's also true that with that level of variation, um, under average conditions, there will be sires whose progeny are essentially not going to cycle within a, fairly, a short three month mating period. And we, we certainly did observe that in those bulls. You know, we identified heifers uh, that were the progeny of a couple of those particularly bad bulls for lactation and estrus and they didn't cycle before they weaned their calves. The other thing that happened as part of this project was a fairly close look at opportunities to improve our understanding of the genetics of male reproduction. Um, so as part of the third round of the CRC project, the male progeny of the cows we've just been talking about evaluating for aged puberty and lactation and estrus Interval were retained as bulls. Um, they were semen sampled at 12, 18 and 24 months of age. They had sperm morphology assessments done, um, which involved looking at 100 cells for each animal, um, identifying any non-viable cells and classifying those into different specific abnormalities. Um, but the key number we'll look at here is percent normal sperm, which is just the proportion of viable cells within that sample. A key result uh, for this trait is that variation in general and certainly genetic variation and heritability were very age dependent. Um, this table is a demonstration of the additive variance and heritabilities for Brahmin and tropical composite bulls uh, for samples collected at 12, 18 and 24 months of age. Uh, the first thing to, to jump out from these results was that Brahmins produced almost no viable samples as yearlings um, and it was only in, at 18 and 24 months of age that we got useful samples from them. But there's a big difference in the level of genetic variation between those two sampling periods. Uh, almost 200 uh, at 18 months of age and less than half of that at 24. And the heritability is correspondingly 0.3 at 18 for Brahmins, 0.2 at uh, 24 months of age. For the tropical composites, interestingly, um, they showed the greatest variation and the greatest heritability for the trait at an earlier age, at 12 months old. Um, and it's, it's quite consistent with what we see in these sorts of animals running under com commercial conditions in Northern Australia. Uh, Brahmins become sexually active a lot later than their composite counterparts, and certainly a lot later than 
British bred sort of cattle. One of the really important questions that we, we wanted to address in looking at male reproductive performance uh, was what information it could give us about their female relatives. And these are genetic correlations of Brahmin bull percent normal sperm with female age at puberty and lactation and estrus interval. So as we saw in the last slide, um, at 12 months of age, we're getting no information from these young Brahmin bulls. But at 18 and 24 months, we're seeing consistently negative uh, genetic correlations, uh, which is favorable. That explains a relationship of higher percent normal sperm with lower age at puberty and lower lactation and estrus interval, which are both desirable. And those correlations are strong enough that we can exploit these measurements as indirect descriptors of female reproductive performance. Really pleasingly, it's a measure we can take in selection candidates. So we can take a semen sample from a young Brahmin bull, um, do a morphology test on it, include those results in a genetic evaluation and via these correlations get information about the reproductive performance of their female relatives as opposed to having to mate those bulls you know do a progeny test on them get their female progeny mate them see how long it takes them to become pubertal and how long it then takes them to conceive when lactating so it definitely shortens the time for data to come in on these on these key traits. So I think just to wrap up the CRC element of this, I think key results from this work was that we had developed some really accurate descriptors of female reproduction um, and that those were for a reproduction trait very heritable. Um, it means we, we had tools which would allow us to make rapid genetic progress for these economically important traits in tropical beef breeds. Um, we also showed that male traits can be exploited as genetic indicators of these females' descriptors of reproduction, but there's no getting around the fact that these are difficult and expensive and expertise-intensive traits to record. Um, there is a lot of inputs required to get this, this data, which in the era of genomics makes them prime candidates for recording in a reference population situation. Um, and that's one of the things we'll, we'll look at now. So just a bit of where we went from the end of the CRC before we wrap that up. Um, in our breed plan evaluation for tropical breeds now, we have results for age at puberty and lactation and estrus interval coming into the analysis. Um, they're being recorded intensively in research herds, which are putting data into the evaluations for these breeds. Um, genomics is being applied to spread accuracy for these traits to related animals. Um, and both of them are contributing to the trait which currently describes female reproduction, which is days to calving. So we don't have separate EBVs for age at puberty and lactation and estrus. They're just driving accuracy via correlations with days to calving for that trait. More recently, we've also introduced percent normal sperm EBVs uh, for Brahmins and coming soon for Santa Gertrudis. And again, it allows breeders to select to improve percent normal sperm directly, and at least as importantly, it serves as a correlated trait with female reproduction. So the next couple of areas I'd like to cover are how we're taking these complicated, expensive traits from research to industry. And the first of those is a very brief look at the Reprenomics project. 
This is a, a large industry funded project uh, that's led by Dr. David Johnson, so who I think some of you will be familiar with, and is really applying what we learned in the beef CRC uh, on a larger scale uh, and under more co commercial conditions. It's still focusing on those same traits, so we're intensively recording uh, heifers for age at puberty. Uh, we're looking at lactating first calvers and recording lactation and estrus interval. Um, unfortunately, we're not getting any male reproduction from this particular project, but it's one of the features of the next project we'll look at. Uh, the males in this case are being steered and are going to sorter to give us some carcass information. The Repronomics project has expanded on the breeds that were involved in the CRC. So we've still got purebred Brahmins involved, uh, but we've also included Santa Gertrudis and drought master animals, which weren't in the, the initial CRC research. There's also plans for crossbreds uh, and their performance to be evaluated in the next phase of this project. And that's likely to start in the next three or four years. And key uh, to this work is that as quickly as we can generate this information in this project, it's being included in the respective evaluations for these three breeds at the moment. So we're getting this data as quickly as we can, and it's driving EBV accuracy within the commercial evaluations for these breeds as, as quickly as can be done. The next aspect of getting this technology out into the industry we'll look at is some work we've done with a, a privately owned uh, stud producer in Northern Australia. Uh, the property is called Kairu. Um, Agbu has had a interaction with them for five or six years now. The Kairu Enterprise is an aggregation of five neighbouring properties in the Fitzroy River Basin of central Queensland. Uh, the map on the right there just identifies the location of the property relative to Rockhampton on the coast, which is kind of the, the centre for tropical beef production in, in Australia. Combined, the properties make up 34,500 hectares, uh, 600 of which are irrigated lucina. Uh, lucina is a leguminous uh, shrubby crop. It produces high energy, high protein feed, but is, is difficult to manage. Stock-wise, there are a thousand Brahmin stud females run on the, the five properties um, and about 5,000 commercial cows. Commercially, the herd is targeting an organic market. Um, it's a market that has reasonably high costs of production and tight specifications around what they accept. Uh, they're targeting turnoff weights of about 480 kilograms, and there are some minimum requirements around growth rate uh, to meet these market specifications. Um, that was challenging for the, the business when it started, and Agbu was approached in 2014 to try to evaluate the genetics of the herd and make any suggestions that could help them improve compliance for that market. So following a review of the Kairu breeding program, it was identified that like a lot of breeders of tropical cattle, low reproduction rates were a key limiter of productivity and profitability for the herd. Because the, the herd had been so well evaluated, we were able to met, benchmark them against the Brahmin breed pretty accurately and identify that they were below breed average for days to calving and scrotal circumference, um, and about breed average for our growth, uh, fat, muscling, um, tenderness, and temperament traits. The review concluded that a targeted breeding pro program could improve profitability for the herd. Um, intensive recording in, within the stud uh, presented opportunities to in increase rates of genetic gain for these key reproduction traits. And the production system and market that they were targeting warranted creation of a custom selection index. 
So in 2015, we implemented an ovarian scanning program um, measuring age at puberty in all the young heifers and lactation and estrus interval in lactating first calf females. And all of the bulls were also semen sampled for sperm morphology testing at 18 and 24 months of age. This was an expensive process um, and we approached the industry funding body MLA uh, to see if we could get some assistance with the costs of this exercise because we could clearly demonstrate that the data that was coming from this recording was of clear benefit to the, to the broader industry uh, across the entire Brahmin breed. Data was going into Brahmin breed plan and was benefiting any animals that were related to those recorded in the Cairo herd. Importantly, it was also the only source since the end of the beef CRC of percent normal sperm data coming into the Brahmin evaluation. Thankfully, we were successful in attracting that funding and we got some support to help us with the, the cost of the recording program, as well as genotyping of all of the males and females that we were evaluating as part of the project. We were also careful to make sure that the project was well linked to the Reprenomics project by exchange of genetic material. Um, so the data coming from this can also be analysed as part of that project. So to date we've collected about 700 records of aged puberty in heifers, about half that in lactating first calf females to describe lactation and estrus interval. About 725 bulls have been evaluated for percent normal sperm, and all of these animals have been genotyped with a, a custom Boss Indicus 35K chip. So far, we've evaluated the progeny of 70 bulls uh, over the three years of the MLA project. That's been a total of 7,100, I'm sorry, those sires have over 7,000 progeny uh, represented in the broader Brahmin evaluation, and 26 of them have progeny outside of the Kairu herd, which totals almost 2,500 animals. As a result of the recording that's occurred just in the progeny of those 70 bulls within this project, we've seen an increase in the accuracy of percent normal sperm EBVs of about 30% across all 70 of those sires. Um, obviously that fluctuates from animal to animal um, and we have to acknowledge that we were starting from a pretty low base uh, for some of these bulls, but an average increase of 30% gives people much better opportunities to apply selection for the trade and do so accurately. Um, our female recording has resulted in increases in days to calving EBV accuracy in the order of 7 to 15 percent. Um, this was already a herd that was recording the trait reasonably well, so we're just creating increased spread in the EBVs for animals related to those females recorded as part of this exercise. Um, they're also getting a fair boost in female reproduction trade accuracies from the Reprenomics project, given the, the, link we's, the links that we've established between those two projects. But the effort within this one herd um, has spread opportunity to apply accurate selection for reproduction traits to a lot of breeders around the Brahmin breed. Finally, and, and fairly quickly, um, I'd like to just bring you right up to date with some work we're doing currently in temperate breeds. Uh, we've done all this work in the last 20 years looking at these traits in, in tropical breeds, and this is just playing a bit of catch up really in temperate breeds to help us understand the genetics of these traits in Southern Australia. So the objectives of this work was to apply the serial scanning methods that we developed in the beef CRC to look specifically at aged puberty in temperate beef heifers. And that was a group of Herefords and a group of Angus um, females from seed stock breeders. Um, we wanted to quantify the variation in aged puberty in the current population 
just see if there was any differences. Um, we really were going into uncharted territory with this. We weren't sure what we would see. And certainly we do not face the same level of problem around reproduction in temperate breeds that we see in the tropicals. Um, and once we've collected these records, uh, finally to look at the genetics of these traits, whether there's genetic variation, uh, whether it's heritable, and whether there are any genetic relationships with cow body composition. <clears throat> so the animals involved in this study were from seven Angus herds and three Hereford herds. Um, they were all herds that have a long history of submitting good quality data to breed plan. Um, they are registered with their respective societies um, and as an absolute minimum we needed them to be contributing dates of birth and genotypes um, with pedigree recorded. Uh, all of them were doing that and you know all of them were doing far better than that. The traits we were looking at is a binary trait, uh, one zero, whether animals were pubertal in the mating or not. Um, we also had age at puberty as defined for the beef CRC, um, just the date at which we observed their first corpus luteum minus their date of birth. And for any animals that weren't cycling, we also created a penalised trait. Um, which was the maximum age at puberty um, of an animal's contemporary group plus 21 days, one cycle, for any animals which failed to display a CL um, up to mating. And in this case, mating was synchronization for, for AI. Um, so all of these, we, we had to stop recording um, once these animals were synchronized, obviously, Synchronizing estrus uh, completely removes our opportunity to record it as, as a natural trait. <clears throat> While we were ovarian scanning, we were also recording information about female growth and body composition. So we're getting weights, measuring hip height, using ultrasound to measure fat depth and giving the animals a body condition score. Um, that's one being poor and five being in extremely good condition. It's worth pointing out that the technicians that we used for this work were extremely good, experienced ovarian scanners, uh, but they were not accredited breed plan carcass scanners. And most of them hadn't had a lot of experience condition scoring. So I think the the key result to come out of this, um, and it was one that we really were not expecting to see, was that only 52% of heifers were pubertal as they entered their first mating, as they came in for synchronization for AI. So these results are just some averages and standard deviations for the Angus and Hereford animals that we scanned for this project. And we've got results for their age at puberty, uh, the penalised age at puberty with, you know, and with so such a high proportion of animals not pubertal, this trait then becomes a really key trait. Uh, there's also averages for the proportion that became pubertal. We can see we got records on almost 3,000 Angus and almost 1,000 Herefords. Um, and as we said, they're only about 52% pubertal going into mating. Age at puberty for those animals that were cycling was very close to a year old for both breeds. And with the penalty applied for those that didn't cycle, it got out to almost 400 days. The next thing that was, was interesting was that on average, these females weren't in bad shape. Um, we really can't blame condition on their failure to show any signs of estrus up to their first mating. This again is just some, some raw averages of their growth and body composition as 
uh, at their first scan, uh, so that's post weaning, and their final scan into mating. Um, post weaning animals were just a little bit under 300 days old, a little bit younger for the Herefords, into mating uh, around 400 days. Weights, they were you know, around 300 kilos at their post weaning scan, 300 and almost 70 for Herefords, 340 for, sorry, 370 for Angus, 340 for Herefords. Hip heights were almost identical. Condition scores are a bit telling here, um, and both at 2.9 for Angus, 2.6 for Herefords, are describing animals that weren't in bad shape, although it's worth pointing out that there was variation in this. There were certainly animals within herds that were not in as good a condition as, as some others. Um, Fat-wise, 5 mils of fat post weaning for the Angus, going up to 7 uh, indomating, and almost exactly the same result indomating for Herefords. <clears throat> So those results show that on both the, at the raw level, um, for both puberty and growth and body composition traits, Angus and Herefords showed almost no differences at all, um, which was pleasing, I must say. This was not set up as a breed comparison. Uh, it's inevitable that people look at these results that way. There's no capacity to pick differences based on the design of this experiment. But it was nice to see that they're pretty much the same. This is just a demonstration of the proportion of animals within each breed, that's red for Herefords, black for Angus, um, at each scan. Um, on average, our Angus got four scans from post weaning to mating, Herefords only got three. But we can see that that trend is very consistent across both breeds and describes a pretty consistent rate of animals becoming cyclic um, over that period. The big question in all this is, do we have opportunity based on these measurements to make useful selection decisions? And really pleasingly, um, age at puberty in both breeds was High, well, highly heritable for a reproduction trait. So if we just look within the animals that had a CL up to their first mating, um, the trait was almost 30% heritable, 0.26 for Herefords, 0.27 for Angus. Um, the penalised trait, which becomes the, the go-to trait for most of our subsequent analyses, uh, about 10% more heritable, 38% uh, for Herefords, 37% for Brahmins. Um, and even because it's so close to 50%, analysing the binary percent pubital trait gives us opportunities to make genetic progress for the trait. 36% heritable in Herefords and 32 in, in Angus. Finally, uh, one of the key questions we wanted to address in this early work in Bostaurus animals was whether there were genetic relationships between body condition, uh, that's growth and body composition traits, prior to mating and their performance as far as, as puberty went. Um, and I think it was interesting to observe that there were not strong genetic relationships between either their weight, their height, uh, how fat they were, or their, their overall condition score. And this, this table just presents the genetic correlations in the right-hand column uh, between the penalised age at puberty trait and these four metrics of growth and body composition, uh, weight, height, fatness, and condition score. We can see that all of them describe a relationship of higher growth and body composition with lower or younger age at puberty, um, but that none of them are especially strong. The strongest relationship was actually with condition score at minus 0.26. 
but it's not suggesting that there are causal links at the genetic level between these traits. And certainly, unfortunately, uh, no real opportunity to exploit these much more easier descriptors of body condition um, as correlated traits with age at puberty. So I think the next steps in this work, um, we need to record the trait in naturally mated females. Um, when I designed this project, it was, you know, on the back of massive anecdotal evidence that these breeds do not have major problems with reproduction. Certainly conception, calving, weaning rates are pretty good for Angus and Hereford heifers. Um, the fact that we only saw about half of them cycling into mating means that we're going to have to continue scanning beyond mating, uh, that we can't synchronize for AI, and we have to observe variation as bulls are introduced to the herd and see what happens between then and the end of that mating period. Um, to that end, there's a new project uh, just in development uh, that will mate 2,000 females of numerous breeds annually, and all of those will be evaluated, or the progeny of all of those as they come around, will be evaluated for aged puberty and lactation and estrus interval. <clears throat> um, these are all females that are sourced from well-recorded herds, and we've got as many breeds as we could um, represented in that study. So there will be Angus, Herefords, Shorthorns, Wagyu, Charolais, and Brahmins involved. And those Brahmins will give us linkage to the Reprodomics project up north, which will really add to the, the value of this work. So just to summarize, uh, I think over the course of the research that we've described in this presentation, uh, we've been able to develop and prove some methods to accurately describe reproduction in both males and females for tropical breeds. And those traits have been implemented in the genetic evaluation for those breeds. Um, we've developed a framework for refer reference populations, both in, an in, in a research-based structure, as well as in commercial seed stock herds, and that's been undertaken successfully. In temperate breeds, the research into these traits is at a much earlier stage, but our early results suggest that aged puberty uh, definitely warrants further attention. Um, the fact that we only had 50% of heifers pubertal into mating, I think means that it's a trait that needs to be included in the genetic evaluation and at least monitored as selection pressure is applied uh, in other aspects of productivity. Clearly for those breeds, we also need to tackle lactation and estrus interval, um, and that will be the focus of future research uh, in those breeds. Uh, thank you for your attention, uh, and I look forward to taking any questions that you may have. Right, awesome. So I think we've got Matt on the line here. If uh, I'm gonna un good afternoon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Great. So I, I see that we have several questions in the chat. I'd like to invite anyone else that has a question to please go ahead and, and post anything that you want to ask Matt. Um, and I see in some of the answers, it looks like you wanted to address a few of them live. So I'll hand it over to you and, and you can go through um, the questions that, that you want to do. Thanks, Megan. Um, I think the big one, and we kind of got around to it as the talk went on, was if there's any association between these growth and body composition traits and what we're observing in genetic reproduction. And as much as we'd like it to be the case, those correlations aren't strong. Um, generally, certainly not good enough to allow us to rely on measures of weight and fatness and eye muscle area uh, to give us useful information about reproduction. Uh, and the bottom line, and we've been, been saying it for a, a few years now, is that if we want to effectively include reproduction in our genetic evaluations, 
we're we're stuck with having to measure it. And these these new traits, you know, give us the opportunity to do that as accurately as we can. Okay, scanning through here. Um, looks like we have one more new question. Um, have you done anything? Or are you planning to do anything with activity meters to record age at puberty? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as as luck would have it, we while this scanning was going on in a, a subset of these Angus heifers, we we had some collars on that, that included measurements of activity. Uh, and, you know, one of the first reactions to these results was that our scanning wasn't, wasn't capturing the trait as well as it did in, in Brahmins. Um, we thought it could just be missing it and be wrong, but we did have these activity measures, uh, which were identifying first oestrus in, in young heifers and pleasingly identifying, you know, almost exactly the same animals cycling at almost exactly the same time. So I think there's there's real opportunities to improve the ways we're, we're recording the trait um, and hopefully, you know, reduce some of that labour intensiveness. Although these these remote sensing methods bring their own their own issues, but it certainly opens up possibilities. Awesome. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat box. So with that, I'm going to thank you again, Matt, for joining us today. Um, we can see through your window back there that it's uh, still dark outside. So <laughs> um, and through my eyes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Very much appreciate you um, putting together all this really interesting information to share with us and for uh, taking the time to join us today. So thank you again. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, you bet. State University are proud to host the 2021 Beef Improvement Federation Annual Research Symposium and Convention. The convention will be located in downtown Des Moines with easy access to the airport, hotels, and local restaurants. Iowa State University is just north with its research and teaching farms. Join us in Iowa and experience how Iowa provides the beef industry with innovation to application.